Okay. How y'all doing? Good. Good. So I am a displaced Canadian, and I live in Athens, Georgia. And I own three restaurants, two there, one here. But I've kind of fallen for this southern landscape and this southern amazingness of food that we have that is constantly talked about in the world today. It's very lauded to be a southern food chef uh, these days because it's the one area of food history in the south. The southern, southern food has this deep history, whereas other regions have a little bit of stuff going on culinarily. They definitely have some food history, just not as much as the south does. The South has this endless bastion of stuff that I can look into every day and never get bored, which is good for my personality. Um, what we're doing today is using a very classic risotto recipe, but using a very different style of rice. The South was very big in grains and was very big along the coastal region of the Low Country from Georgia to South Carolina in rice production. This is 150 years ago, 200 years ago. And what they did was they grew a varietal called Carolina Gold. But when you sift rice, you have broken kernels and you have whole kernels. The whole kernels are shipped off. They're the expensive ones that go to Europe and is the, is the main economy. While the slave trade or the slaves uh, who were the Gullah population there would keep the broken kernels and that became the starch in their diet. So what happens when you break a kernel of rice? It exudes starch really quickly. So what happens is you create a porridge or a grits almost. Um, and this, this pack and this porridge became the staple that we love to work with here. So we do a lot of different things with it, but it makes phenomenal risotto. Whenever I'm giving a cooking class of any type, what I want you to do is take away some aspect of technique and ideas behind it that you can then transfer to wherever you are. So you can make the same dish with whatever vegetable. We're just in the middle of turnip season. That's where we're using these beautiful Hakurai Tokyo turnips and their greens. But you can use uh, any different vegetable leeks or beautiful corn in the summer or fava beans in the springtime or asparagus, things like this. So always broaden the horizon for what's good in your marketplace. Take that time to go shop at the farmer's market and find out what's good. Um, I'm just going to put this off to the top for one sec. Then in rice-wise, you can use any uh, short grain Italian rice like a carnaroli or a violone. Or a, um, the, so there's a lot of, or a simple arborio. So there are lots of different choices in that. But all I'm looking for you to show you is how easy it is in 17 to 20 minutes, which is what it takes to make risotto, to make a full meal or a nice side dish or whatever it may be for your family or at home, for yourself, whatever it may be. So it's very simple. Right now, in this pan, I've got some sweet onion and some uh, olive oil and I've sweated down. I've got a little tiny little bit of color on the onion and that's okay. I'm going to add my broken kernel rice. This is from Anson Mills. Anson Mills is this crazy guy named Glenn Roberts. Um, who is a very fastidious man who saved a lot of really beautiful grains of the South that are very important to the South. This is before GMO and genetic modification of, of, of plant seeds. He's gone back and saved these and has this treasure trove of seed stock for showing off what the South is really about. So whether it be bene, which is sesame, or CL and red peas, or different crowder peas and uh, beautiful different varietals of rice, this guy does it all. So he does beautiful, beautiful work out of Columbia, South Carolina. He's kind of very renowned in the region. You see his grits on like the fancier southern restaurants in New York. Okay, so right now I'm just toasting off the rice. Just kind of glistening each little kernel with just a little bit of that oil and that onion. Just to kind of loosen it up and allow the stock to individually permeate all of those little pieces of rice. So all risotto is, and people get scared about making risotto because they think they have to stick around the pot for an hour, stirring with a wooden spoon, <coughs> with a small chain anklet attached to the stove. It's actually really easy. And you can just get a nice bottle of wine and sit, invite your friends in. They can sit at the counter as you make risotto. It's very, very simple. So we're going to start adding the stock. And you're just looking to really moisten and then go above by maybe about half an inch with stock. This is good homemade chicken stock. When you're making chicken stock, it's really easy. Um, you don't just unwrap those little cubes and dilute them in water. That's what our parents did. But we need to move beyond that school of thought because that's full of junk that we don't need in our diet. What we do is we take whole chickens and we butcher them down. So easily butchering a chicken takes about five minutes and you get breasts and you get thighs and you get drumsticks and you get gizzards and you get livers and you get the little oysters on the back and you get the wings and you get all these different parts that you can make multiple meals with and it's far less expensive than buying uh, really inexpensive boneless chicken breasts or something like that. It's much less expensive to buy a whole bird. 
But then you've got the wonderful carcass. So you can, to make a dark chicken stock, you'd roast it off and make it a traditional stock. I make stocks a lot in a pressure cooker at home because it's really fast and it takes about 25 minutes. And it's the only thing I use a pressure cooker for. And otherwise it's like this $80 pot that I bought that I never use. And we all have one, so you should use it. Or a slow cooker, like you make pot roasts in, are great because you can set it up in the morning, walk away from it for eight hours, come back, perfect and ready to go. Okay, as you can see, I'm not stirring this all the time, which is fine. Come on in. How's it going? Good. It's a nice day. It's like 75 degrees outside. Okay, so I'm adding stock slowly but surely. And I'm gonna season with a little bit of salt. Just I sort of season as I go through. Right now over here, I've taken these turnips, I've taken some of them, and I'm macerating them. So they're completely raw, but shaved really thin on a little mandolin, but you could also do it with a knife. Beautiful little Hakurai turnips from the local market. You don't even need to peel them, they're that, that good, they're tiny, golf ball size, and they're really, really tender. So I've shaved them down, and I've added a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of olive oil, and some salt. I'm just letting that sit. It becomes its own little salad topping for the risotto that we'll put on and garnish with later. Over here, I've got <coughs> the really feathery greens um, of the turnips, which um, contrary to popular belief, do not need to cook for multiple hours in a large pot with half of a pig in it. Um, you can, Southern greens get this uh, sort of idea and generalized notion that they're just cooked forever into this pack, this porridge. You don't have to do that anymore. These are beautiful light greens. Collard greens I still tend to cook for a fairly long time. Sometimes we get collard greens so young and so fresh and so tiny that you can just saute them up in a little bit of butter or pork fat or bacon fat or whatever. Um, so we're gonna stick these in right at the very end. We're really gonna just gonna cook in the, in the warmth of the risotto and that's really it. Okay, then I've got some scallion to garnish with. So that's gonna go over there. But finishing risotto, you're gonna use good butter and good Parmesan Reggiano. Invest in good things, you take good simple things, you make something very simple, but yet luxurious. So this is the idea of food that I'm after. I'm after the way of constructing a simple, simple dish, really consistently in your home, that's easy, that it's gonna wow people, and seasonally you can change throughout the year and add different things. So that summer corn risotto that you make, that spring fava bean risotto that you make, those type of things. So this goes in at the very end, and it just almost mounts up on the risotto and provides this luxurious and unctuous finish to everything. I like risotto to be much softer than often you see it. Sometimes it's standing in a pyramid structure of stickiness, and that's not my thing. My thing is much more moist, like a Milanese style. Very, very, um, sort of almost runny looking, but as soon as you scoop it up, you'll notice that it sets up on your, on your, uh, on your spoon just properly. Everything sets up and it becomes perfect. At that point in time, you could top it with some roasted chicken. You can serve it with a whole roasted chicken and a simple salad. But really, to me, this is just one aspect of a meal. Or it can be a meal in its entirety with some cheeses and some salumis and some raw vegetables on the side. I'm just trying to sort of illustrate how easy making food from scratch really is. Okay, so this is almost saturated. I'm not cooking it down to dry, but I'm cooking it down to about that consistency each time. Okay, and then we're adding more stock. And this, from start to finish, Paul Bertoli, who is the original chef at Chez Panisse, Alice Waters is not really a chef, she's the restaurant owner, she's very sweet and very important in food policy world, but she's not really a chef, and she'll be the first to tell you that. Um, Paul Bertoli is an amazing guy who has a salami company now called Fra uh, Framani um, in Oakland, and he is, was, wrote the most beautiful risotto recipe that ended with, you just know when it's done. This is a breakthrough moment in cooking for me when I was young, and it didn't make any sense. And then, it did. And those are the breakthrough moments that you have in kitchens where you're like, I'm beginning to understand food more. And that's when cooking becomes fun and it doesn't become this travail, this work that we have to do every day. Oh, I have to make dinner. It becomes this fun time to hang out with your family for 20 minutes and cook something and then sit around the table and eat it. So, you should do it. Okay, still stirring. Got a number, a couple minutes to go. You guys got any questions so far? Yes. Risotto seems to be a fad right now, and it's only been around for a few years. Where was it eight or nine years ago? I mean, I've been making risotto, I look young. I'm 41. I've been risotto, making risotto for probably since I was 16, 17. 
I think that's when it really started off. It was really in the in the sort of vernacular of really Italian restaurants at that point in time. Um, I remember cooking in Montreal, making risotto, like six different types of risotto from scratch on one menu. Um, that was not very fun. Um, and then uh, out in California, I think that was really the resurgence of uh, risotto in North America, utilizing fresh ingredients from the local area, which is really what California cuisine taught us, which is this redefining of what is local food. But in my experience, the uh, risotto is just basically kind of sticky rice. Aha! We are about to prove you wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's a challenge. Seriously. If I screw this up, I every restaurant in the world now has, nope. has risotto, and it's it, always a kind of a sticky rice. Yeah, and, and it's often that uh, sort of last choice that the chef makes on the menu that's yeah. almost an escapist thing. It's like they they don't really have to work at it, and they par cook it halfway and then finish it off. It's not really that good. So this is more the way risotto, risotto is a peasant dish. I mean, truly and simply, it is a pack, it's a porridge, it's like grits. I mean, it is a peasant dish. This is a heightened peasant dish, but in, may, no way, may, ugh, in no way is it meant to be ultra highfalutin food. I'm not really into ultra highfalutin food. My food is meant to be really good restaurants, but we're not meant to be really super fine dining restaurants. So, I'm fancy peasant. Okay. Let me talk briefly about southern food and what I believe southern food is, and I'll get back to that sort of idea that I talked about at the very beginning. Southern food really is in this hip stage. At the same time that it's hip, it's also much maligned as the one that kills everybody and causes heart disease and diabetes and all these things. That's not southern food. That's food of convenience that has completely engulfed the United States ever, everywhere. <coughs> southern food is not a bucket of fried chicken and a thing of biscuits. Southern food is a small, beautiful thing of fried chicken with succotash and rice perlu and local beans and corn in season and sliced tomatoes and basil from the garden. That's okra. southern food to me. Sorry? Okra. Okra and okra, succotash, things like that. So this great thing, this great spread, and that's the real mark, the spread of southern food, this amazing amount of different dishes, that, the, the, the thing that's going to kill you is the fried chicken if you ate just that. Well, it's really constituting, when I eat fried chicken, 20% of what I eat in my plate. It's just one little thing. So it's, I think they, there's a number of people who try to define Southern food and they do it completely wrong. Let me talk to you about one, one person, who's Paula Deen. And Paula Deen is somebody I love, but I think it's very misguided in this way of food, because you can't just food, stick food between donuts and call it good. It's not good for you. So I was up on stage with Paula Deen and I uh, get these gigs where people want me to ask questions of people and sort of MC in front of like 1,500 people and they're all rabid Paula Deen fans. Ah, crazy. And Paula's sitting there and I'm supposed to be lobbing her questions. I asked, Do you, does your version of Southern food have a beginning and an end? And she said, yeah, I'm trying to preserve something. And I said, well, mine doesn't. Mine is constantly being defined as we change in our community what the South becomes every day, how it grows, how it advances, how Asian cultures come to it, how Latino cultures are moving into it, how other people from the North who once lived here a hundred years ago are coming back and repopulating Atlanta and bringing things that they learn from their grandmothers who learn from their grandmothers. That's my Southern food. And I explained one dish utilizing exactly this ingredient, which is this rice midlands. And what it was is it's a dish that we do often here at Empire State South, but I haven't done it. It's not on the menu right now. But I take rice grits, or rice midlands, broken kernel rice like this, and make it into grits. So it cooks up, and then I finish it with house-made kimchi that's really finely chopped. So it gives us this spicy, spicy feeling and spicy finish brought to me um, in influence by my drive home. I go through an area called Buford Highway on the northeast of Atlanta, which is very amazing groupings of different Asian communities there. Great restaurants, fun. It's just a total different vibe as we see in the south but it's still the South. In, that's inflecting this amazing historical preciousness, which is these broken kernels of rice that have such history of, of the strife in the South, of food in the South, of the connection we have to food in the South. On top of that is this beautiful crisp pork belly. It's pork, it's the South, we need that. And then on top of that is some pickled local radishes um, from Woodland Gardens, this farm that I very uh, have a very close kinship with in Athens, Georgia. I, I'm explaining this dish. Paul is still beside me. I'm off on my own soliloquy, reading, 
And, and the, she's confused. She has no idea what I'm talking about in food because she doesn't cook this way. This is not how she thinks. So she looks at me and she goes, what's in front of everybody, just for the crowd, goes, what's wrong with butter and salt? And she's right. There's nothing wrong with butter and salt. But I'm out for the advancement of taking the core idea of this food of community in the South and stretching the boundaries of it and having fun with it and using the seasons and reminding ourselves what the seasons are all about. So that's kind of the idea of Southern food to me. And that's kind of what we do here every day. So we buy from 45 different farms. We'll serve 200 people tonight. You saw the bar at the crazy zoo of a restaurant. We still do very meticulously styled plates and everything like that. But at the core of it, it's purely Southern. So this is this very displaced carpetbagger beyond carpetbagger, because I'm from Ottawa, Canada, um, who has fallen for this sense of place down here, this idea of this food, because it's really got this romantic beauty to it in the attachment that people have to food. And you go anywhere, you can go to rural Georgia and find the best food. And that's kind of what the South's all about. But that's what, the, that's what this style of food's all about. Okay, so when we talk about risotto being done, getting done, we're about to finish it. We're, we're looking for that starch being released and this sort of cloudiness emanating around each kernel of rice. You see it, you, 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 you can run your spoon through it, and it's just beginning to set up. It's setting that creaminess as opposed to being this wateriness around each kernel. Now it's become this creaminess that has a little texture, has a little um, sort of tactile-ness to it, and is enrobing each little kernel. And that's what we're looking for. We don't want to cook it to the point of being a sticky pack. We want a little bite in the center. But now I'm going to go ahead and finish it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to add um, find a regular spoon, and I'm going to add some butter. So this is good butter. This is uh, plus gras unsalted French-style butter. Um, we get some local butter, uh, but local produ butter production is not as good as local other dairy product production. Uh, so it's hard to find locally. This is Parmesan Reggiano, local if you're from Italy, but I just love Parmesan Reggiano. Really good um, Parmesan does not come from a green canister in the door of your fridge. Um, and this is the classic example where you need to be investing in products. I want all of you not to be uh, feel bad when you roll over in your grave going, I should have eaten better because it would have tasted better and we would have had more fun. Do it now, spend a little more money on your cheese. Um, okay, so we're stirring that in. Literally the butter, the butter is cold, the butter is mounting into that and will emulsify as opposed to just dropping in butter and having it melt on top. It's actually going to become part of the risotto. I'm gonna take my greens and stick them in and I'm also gonna take some of the shaved um, turnips. So this idea that you have to cook turnips, I'm trying to get one of them, really thin. So it's still got a little bit of the top on there, which we actually like. This idea that you have to cook turnips as long as um, my mother did, and I'm sure many other mothers did, where they're, they're just these gray matter in a pot um, served with overcooked meat. So wrong. Sorry, mom, but so wrong. Everybody's like, did you grow up in a really good cooking food household? I'm like, no. Um, I, I've learned to love food, though. Um, so, you know, these, these take seconds to cook. You can eat them raw, and they're great. So this idea of Southern cookery being about overcooked vegetable, it's a thing of the past as well, too. We treat things totally different than we used to here in the, in, along the West Coast and everywhere in the United States. We have a better appreciation for vegetables than we've ever had. We just need to continue on that trend. Okay, so I've got this pretty much done. I'm going to re-moisten this just a little bit, and I'm going to walk around and just show you texturally what I'm looking for. I'm going to add just a little more of the greens. I want it really nice and bright green. Um, you can also take uh, greens like this and blanch them really quickly, just for like 30 seconds, and then puree, puree them with a little bit of rice in the blender. Or ice. Did I say rice? I'm looking at rice. I meant to say ice. Um, and what that'll do is give you a green puree or what I call chlorophyll. That chlorophyll can be used then to color anything you want. So you could, there's a storm brewing on the other side. Um, you can color whatever you want. So you can make this a very green risotto by adding that green at the very end. If you add it too soon, you'll have a very nice shade of brown. But if you add it at the perfect time, you'll have this bright green, which is really fresh looking. But you'll cook up that chlorophyll color in a matter of moments. So. Okay, so this is the texture I'm looking for. 
Mashed, mashed potatoes and spinach. Yeah, that's good. Okay, <laughs> that's good. We're going to start no. with that. Oh, and then <laughs> we're going to come up with a better descriptive by the end of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Table two. <laughs> um, I love the taste. No, no, you're going to taste no, it. You, you. So in the recipe, it does say uh, where it says add the butter. Somebody noticed that it said half the butter the other day, and they they did it by this obvious thing, which you guys will all completely understand. I'm an engineer, and um, it was me. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's what we're looking for. Which is exactly like my dad. I'm an economist. And okay. So I'm going to serve this right now. I'm going to give you one pan. You can just guys can pass around each table. So this consistency of this, you realized I was talking the whole time, yet it took me 17, 18 minutes to make this. So you don't have to invite 30 of your closest automotive friends over to make risotto like I did. You could just have your family. So this idea of making these things, it's really straightforward. It's really easy. All I'm trying to encourage you to do is make take the inconvenient path to making good food again in your house because it's so much fun and it's so much better for your family it's so much better for your community when you're investing and in buying locally and and uh getting into the idea of investing in your community i'm just gonna uh get this on i'm gonna do a final little taste because i haven't tasted it and then, um, in my last little flourishes, uh, whatever, hold on one moment. Chef, are there some risottos you make where you, you cook the vegetables in with the rice for a longer time, or do you always, yeah, you you can, you always finish it with it? Um, you could add um, like butternut squash. You could do it at the beginning. I also would reserve a little to puree to cook until yeah. tender, and then puree with a little chicken stock, uh -huh. and then fold that up in the end. It'll give a little more color to it overall. Right. But yeah, that I could start from the beginning. Like a sugar pumpkin pie, or like a or sugar pumpkin or zucchini. Zucchini, I would add towards the end. Zucchini cooks pretty quickly, uh -huh. right, and it gets really overcooked pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah. So okay. Okay, so my little uh, shaved ones are going on top as well, and um, then I'm just going to take a touch of a little bit of olive oil that I have and drizzle that, and then I'm going to go back over with a final flourish of uh, good cheese um, over the top, and really that's pretty much about it. Okay. Hey, what up? You guys pass around, have fun. Anybody has any communication diseases? Keep it away from Frank. Okay, you guys got any questions? How is it? Okay, really, um, you can do this. Enjoy driving. You guys have fun. It's a cool looking crossover. Hey, give us a recipe. I can do the recipe is on the flip side of your menu. So. You need a lot of direction. <laughs> okay, you guys enjoy. Have fun. Food's coming out momentarily. My crew will clean up my mess. Get a round of applause for All good. Thanks, guys.